Welcome back, everyone. I'm, I'm doing something a little bit different uh, today. Um, this is part of a new idea. Um, I'm going to do monthly ranking videos of the movies that I see. Um, part of that is I can be able to address movies that otherwise um, I would not address normally. Uh, or that because of how... Busy life is sometimes I was not able to actually write reviews of. So this could be like a fun little way that in case I don't have a review out, you can at least get my thoughts on some movies real quick. So it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, of course, we're in the middle of February, but I saw a total of seven movies in January. And it was actually a much better year for January films uh, than most January movies. Granted, I didn't see a lot of stuff in January either. I did not even bother with the movie The Turning or anything like that. But I do have uh, some stuff to talk about real quick. Um, uh, let's, let's start at the worst one I saw. I saw Doolittle, which, oh my gosh, I think this is a movie that, uh, the more and more I've thought about it, or explained how I felt about it to people, I hated it more and more. <laughs> uh, it's now at a 2 out of 10, uh, the more I thought about it. I was just like, why did I give this a 3? I despise this. <laughs> um... I guess the the only positive I could really say about it was I did appreciate, um, again, the one gorilla got an arc, but that was about it. It was a movie that did not know what its tone wanted to be, and be it was because it was a movie that was originally this passion project for its director, only the then just nine months before it was supposed to come out, get completely reshot, basically or to keep elements and use the reshoots to create a whole different thing, more family-friendly, apparently. And the result is just a movie that does not know its tone. Um, it doesn't know its tone, it has no consistency between scenes, it feels incredibly rushed, which, you know, is another positive. It thankfully feels very short while you're sitting through it, but it's, it's painful, nevertheless. Um, and, you know, it's why performances feel off. It's it's just a mess of a movie. And I think a good example of how bad it is as a movie is the emotional climax of Dr. Doolittle's, quote, arc, is that he has to stick his hand up a dragon's butt to pull out a literal bagpipe only for the dragon to fart on him and say, all of humanity is no longer bad Mewtwo style. Yeah, that is a good example of how bad the quality of Doolittle is. Um, just above that is Airplane Mode. No, not the Logan Paul movie. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, this was bad, but it was kind of a boring bad, if anything. So the plot of it is... It's this this young this girl. She's like an influencer um, for this company, and she's gotten a lot of trouble. And she gets in a car accident, and legally she cannot use her phone at all. So she gets sent to be with her grandparent, her her grandfather, uh, who is a very strict ludite. Basically, I mean he's not a ludite, but that's basically what it is. And it's really bad. It's it's cookie cutter. It has nothing of real substance to it in terms of what it's trying to say. It's just another, hey, <laughs> phones are bad. <laughs> you know, we, we use a lot of, spend a lot of time on our phones, and it just does a typical young hip person has to learn, you know, humility and perseverance and work ethic from an older, wiser mentor, you know. Like, like, you've seen this movie done before. Like, I've seen this kind of stuff done in Disney Channel episodes. Better, even. Uh, and sometimes even with more nuance to it. Like, sometimes it's a bit of a, yes, we use our phones a lot, but sometimes we need to be willing to uh, socialize with more people. And, again, it just 
halfway through, it doesn't become that at all. It just becomes a nothing movie, like basically every other version of this story told. And it, and it doesn't help that the movie just keeps going. <laughs> um, a good example is there was still like 20 minutes left of the movie when the uh, All is Lost moment happens, which is normal. But I actually found myself falling, like dozing off um, near the end of the movie uh, because nothing was happening in that amount of time. It was like a big oh no, the bad guy is taking our main character's idea. Um, and that's it, you see, and it just ends after that. Like, they, they defeat the bad guy, and it just ends. Uh, there were things I liked about it, though. It did have good blocking and direction. Um, some actually pretty decent shots. Uh, I think there was a little edit I actually really appreciated that any time someone was on their phone, whether it was an extra in the background or one of the main characters, you actually got to see what they were typing in their screens, um, visually speaking, like even in the background, you know. And it's it's very un, it's very like easy to miss, but it was a fun little detail that whenever someone pulled up their phone, even if it was a main character or not, you could actually see what they were typing. Um, I think that actually enforces the theme of the movie far stronger than anything text-wise, so I do give it credit for that. Um, it's just a movie that, like, it just, it, it could easily have been fixed. Um, also, I do appreciate that it was a Brazilian-Portuguese film, because that meant I didn't know how to <laughs> criti critique the acting, aside from, because I do not speak Brazilian-Portuguese. <laughs> I do speak some Spanish. Um, next up, uh, Nino Cooney. I thought it was fine. As I said um, in my review, uh, I thought it was fine. I loved the animation uh, and the design of the world and the characters. Um, and I loved the first half of the movie, but I found the second half of the movie got so bogged down in being really convoluted. And ha it, it again tried to be what a lot of Ghibli movies do. And I've noticed this in almost every Studio Ghibli movie, Hayao Miyazaki whatever, they get really complicated in their plots, but the, one of the things that 90% of the time that they're able to pull off is even with their complex narratives, they still feel whole and uh, comprehensible for the audience, you know. I think the only extreme I, I can think of is I was a bit confused in Howl's Moving Castle at some points, but I still really enjoy Howl's Moving Castle. That is a fantastic movie. Um... But, like, other than that, it, it, it feels like it was trying to replicate that, even though it wasn't. It just ended up getting, like, oh, we're gonna have this thing happen, where they gotta jump between the worlds while this battle is happening, and this and the bat, now the one guy's on the bad guy's team, and the other guy's on the good guy's team, and this is all connected in some weird convoluted way, and this is actually, you know, revealed that the one guy who was in the wheelchair was actually imagined, yeah, yeah, it just, it got really convoluted, um... But no, I thought it was fine. Uh, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I do appreciate that a movie like it got made. I just was a, feel like it could have been a bit stronger in some areas. Uh, next up it's, is Underwater, which I liked. Um, and I talked about briefly in... Uh, I had talked about it in my review. I really liked its uh, sense of tension. I liked its... Um, it's uh, visuals. Uh, I really found myself actually getting really intense. It, it, like it, like it for an alien clone, which is what it is. It was way stronger than it needed to be. It was made, probably my guess is because it was on the studio shelf for th like about two to three years. What happened is it got so edited down, it ended up kind of working because the movie moves very smoothly, surprisingly. Um, and I don't mean that as a bad thing. Sometimes having a movie on the shelf for a while can actually help the movie because you're able to figure out how to make the movie stronger than it already was. But it was a fun little thing that the movie knows when to hold on certain scenes. And overall, it was a fun monster movie. Uh, I, I personally had some issue with my theater-going experience with it because, um, well, it, uh, it... I'm just going to say this is going to be so weird. Uh... So I've, I've said before, and I've said it again, I have Asperger's Syndrome, so 
one of the things that happens sometimes is sensory overload, which can be anything from uh, crowds. Uh, crowds can sometimes be sensory, like cause sensory overload. Um, but most importantly, it's usually loud noises for me, I've noticed, for me specifically. And underwater had way too many moments where it just really kicked in. <laughs> uh, I don't know what was up with uh, my theater's... Uh, my theater's like speakers or something, but it just was really loud at points, and I'm gonna assume it was a speaker problem, because one of my jobs at working in a movie theater is called theater checks, where you check volume and visual level of the movie, um, make sure everything's working in the theater, uh, but no, I liked it, uh, I didn't love it, but I liked it, so that, that's a positive out of a negative. Next up, to all the freckles in the world... <laughs> One of the weirdest titles of <laughs> January 2020. Um, so this one is a Mexican film uh, that I honestly thought was a biopic, like a sports biopic. Like, that's how the poster on Netflix seemed. Um, it's, it's a Netflix exclusive. Um, but it's actually a, like a teen drama, kind of. Um, like, it's, and that's actually one of the things I kind of appreciated about it when I was watching it. It's more focused on, like, like, it's not a cookie cutter Breakfast Club, uh, Sixteen Candles, Ferris Bueller, you know, like, it's not John Hughes. It's not trying to be John Hughes or any other high school movie of its type. It's more focused on these people kind of just being jerks to each other, uh, kind of, like, you, you do like a lot of these characters, but each character ends up, each character has their own motivation for why they're doing a thing, and the movie just really quickly turns into things going wrong, either because of their own, uh, interests getting in the way, or the interest of others, so it's like, we're all screwing each other over, uh, with the conflict, um, which I did appreciate. I feel like that was way more, in terms of trying to replicate how real life works, sometimes that's what real life is like. It's not so much your fault or someone else's. It's sometimes a combination of both. Um, and I really did appreciate that about uh, To All the Freckles in the World. Uh, and I really actually liked that there were some shots in the movie where it just held. Like, it just le like the camera just stood still. And for, like, a couple of, like, about 30 seconds, it just was the characters briefly mentioning something or talking about something. It was stuff I liked. I'm a huge fan of, if I'm being totally honest, when the camera just holds for 30, 30 to 60 seconds on just one shot and just people talking. I love the crap out of that stuff. It's, it feels very organic sometimes. Uh, and then sometimes it can feel gimmicky and boring, but hey... It works for what it was going for the movie. I, I, I can't really say anything else. Uh, I think my big issue is the plot structure is a mess sometimes. Like, there are multiple all is lost moments and multiple, you know, midpoints, if that makes any sense. Like, like it has a three-act structure, but it, everything feels like it's a different place than it's supposed to be. But again, it worked, uh, I, I, there was actually a shot in the movie I, like, absolutely adored, um, and it, it's very simple, it was, um, so, like, the, there's a whole thing about soccer that they're playing, um, and at one point, they do a tracking shot with the actors, but they do it from the perspective of the soccer ball, and so the camera is spinning while it's tracking alongside them in slow motion, it was a gorgeous shot. I, I was in love with it. Um, and I'm so happy I'm geeking out about it because it looked... It was great. It was a great shot. Um, uh, again, I liked it. I didn't love it. I, get, I gave it around a 6 out of 10. So it's, it's a good movie. It's decent. Um, there were elements I think could have been stronger again. Like I feel like the, the plot is such a mess. But... It had a human aspect to it that's pretty hard to find in some movies nowadays. So I do give it credit for that. Um, next up, Troop Zero, um, which I gave a 7 out of 10, and you saw my review of. I really enjoyed uh, Troop Zero. Uh, very by-the-numbers underdog story, but 
it was a lot of fun, um, and the cast is a lot of fun, and the characters are a lot of fun, um, it, if, it's, it's charming, that's, that's the perfect word, it's charming, uh, it's not the best, but it's charming, it fills you with, like, warmth, uh, even if it's a movie we've seen a hundred times, and that's the thing that we tend to forget about tropes sometimes, is tropes, Tropes are used in media often because they work at their strongest. When you can do them right, they can feel authentic and real. Or, when you do them wrong, they can feel cliched and out of place. Um, heck, if you, if you notice anything I've made, the, 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 each one falls into a trope in some way. Like, every... I know, I, this might just be a weird... I make short films on the side sometimes, but... One of the things I've noticed is dealing with tropes is a very common thing, and it's all about execution sometimes, uh, and it works. Again, I liked it. I had a fun time with it. I didn't love it all the way, but, you know, I found myself laughing a couple of times, uh, and I found myself just really moved. It's a very sweet movie, um, and I'm really glad it's on Prime, uh. And finally, last and certainly not least, the best movie of January 2020, uh, not by a lot, I gave it a 7 out of 10, was Gretel and Hansel. Holy crap, guys. <laughs> um, Gretel and Hansel is bonkers, um, and I loved pretty much all of it for that. Um, basically, it's the basic story of Hansel and Gretel. There's not too much in terms of difference they do add like um like a whole different fairy tale in the story about like this little girl who like had these mystical powers and crap um but it's super super moody um it was made only on five million dollars um and visually speaking it is amazing um the camera work like is oh so good um like, it does Terrence Malick-like shots a couple of times, um, or it'll just hold on, like, atmosphere. It's it's all about creating this weird, nightmarish mood um, to the whole thing. You know, it's all about lighting, camera work, and complementing everything. No jump scares, all atmosphere, um, and just tension building. Um, and it's only an hour and ten minutes long. It's a very short film but it works because it understands when it needs to focus on certain elements of the plot. Um, and part of that is you have three main actors all working together, um, and it ends up having way more weight to it than it needed to, even if it is, by its basic standards, just the Hansel and Gretel story. Um, uh, Sophia, I can't remember the last name, but the person who is in, who is prop, who came from It, uh, the It movies, um, she plays Gretel, fantastic performance. Um, her little brother, the person who played Gretel, uh, Hansel, was pretty good. But the the standout is Al Alyssa Craig as the evil witch. Um, and, and it makes sense. She's played the Borg Queen uh, from Star Trek First Contact, which is one of the most disgusting characters I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, but no, she rocks as the witch. Um... It's a very it's a, it's a very easy role to become very cartoony, but she manages to make it unnerving and creepy. Like an actual like it's the first time in probably a long time I've actually been scared of a witch <laughs> cuz I've just been like holy crap this 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 lady is a threat. Um and I do like that a good chunk of the movie is around Gretel and the witch cuz you find out Gretel herself has magic powers and it creates a very interesting dynamic. Um uh, it's not going to be for everyone. It's very, very slow. It is a very slow burn movie. No jump scares. It's all about just wait and see, just wait. And I think a lot of people are not really going to like the fact that it's just basically Hansel and Gretel with, you know, a bit of a creepy atmosphere to it. Um, I know, I, I actually saw, I actually, when I walked out of the movie, there were two audience members who were pissed off at the ending. Uh, not that the ending is controversial or anything. I mean, I, okay, I'll, I'll kind of spoil it, but I, it's really weird trying to say I'm spoiling Hansel and Gretel. Uh, but, like, it does the whole, the witch is, you know, wanting to eat Hansel. 
But instead, it's, in order for you, Gretel, to become me, I'm going to have you eat your brother, and Gretel kills the witch. Um, but the whole thing is that because the witch has this darkness in her, Gretel becomes infected with the darkness, and the movie ends with Hansel leaving, Gretel just out in the woods, and, like, her fingers slowly going black, and she just looks up into the sky. And also there's the whole thing of all the children who got eaten, like their souls returning to heaven. Um, but it just ends with her just staring off into the sky. Um, and for a lot of people, they won't like that. It'll either feel like a sequel bait, which it wasn't. It's an, it's an ending that had a very clear conclusion, but it's a very sad ending. So it was a, it's a case where it might not sit with everyone. I'm just warning you right now. Because again, I, I, I realize I just spoiled Gretel and Hansel, but again, it's the story of Hansel and Gretel. What did you expect? Um... I think my big issue was the first 20 minutes or so, you know. As much as I liked it, it did feel like it was going in a completely different fairy tale direction at points, which it wasn't. Thank goodness, but there's like a whole thing where the Huntsman even briefly shows up, so. But no, I gave it a 7 out of 10, so. I really had a fun time with it, um, and I'm not usually a horror movie guy, so. That, that, that's, that's some, that's some praise for me, uh. Uh, next, I'm, I'm planning right now to work on uh, a Sonic review. I don't know what I'm going to double it with. Um, yeah, it's been weird, like, with the semester starting off and everything, um, and working on Nowhere Man. Uh, but no, I'm hoping to do this because it's going to make it way easier for me to edit and way easier for me to actually talk about the different movies that came out in the month that I don't get to usually, so... Thank you all for watching. Uh, I know that it was only one frame. My apologies. But I hope you guys enjoyed it and, you know, you got to hear about some movies you probably didn't hear about either way. So thank you so much. Farewell. Bye.